Hi, this is Scott Miller. Welcome to my top performance blog. I have the pleasure today of speaking with Dr. Ben Caldwell. Hi, Ben. Hi, Scott. Thanks for talking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I told you when your book came out that I wanted to interview you and I've waited now for several months. I just think your book, uh, which for everybody who's listening is called Saving Psychotherapy, is uh, among the top 10 most important books published in the last five years. Our field, as you document in rich, vivid, and entertainingly written prose, is, is really suffering. And yet, nothing seems to change much about the way we work. But what I wanted to start with is just asking you to tell us a bit about yourself, and then I'd love to know why you wrote a book like Saving Psychotherapy. All right. Well, uh, thank you, first of all. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. Um, I, just, I appreciate the chance to, to talk about the book and, and what went into it. So I'm a marriage and family therapist based in Los Angeles. Um, I've been sort of in the academic world for a long time. I taught for more than 10 years at Alliance International University. Um, left that position a couple of years ago, and now I teach as adjunct faculty for a couple of universities out here. Um, and I've also been in the policy world for a long time. Um, I've done advocacy work for the California Division of AMFT, uh, the National Marriage and Family Therapy Association. And in that role, I've had the chance to sort of get a, a feel for some of the outside forces that are influencing the field of, of therapy in various ways. But the real sort of moment of inspiration for the book, the thing that, that led me to say, wait a minute, what's, what in the world is going on here? actually happened at the 2013 Evolution of Psychotherapy Conference, mm. where I was there in a, in, a, in a packed room to see Marsha Linehan demonstrate DBT. Mm. And just sort of down the row from me by a few seats, there was a woman who um, sort of obliviously, not, not out of ill will or anything, kept reaching into her purse to grab some food or something. And the sound system in the room wasn't really working, so people couldn't hear because of what this woman was doing. Mm. And again, no, no ill will or hostility on her part. She just wasn't aware. And I'm watching as all these therapists all around her are looking at each other, <laughs> rolling their eyes, doing all these things that we do to say, can you believe what's happening here? And nobody is saying a word to this woman. <laughs> and if all of us are you know, society's experts in behavior change. Mm. I couldn't believe that, that nobody was actually doing anything to change a relatively changeable behavior. Mm. And I thought, gosh, that's, I walked away from that, um, that, that workshop at the conference much more interested in that moment mm. of us as therapists, us as a field, sort of collectively not having a lot of courage I was much more influenced by that than I was by what Linehan had to say. And Linehan was fantastic. So, it's, so you know, this was kind of a metaphor, an analog for something larger. Exactly. Yeah. And I thought if, if all of us, again, society's experts in behavior change, aren't confronting this woman on, on her easily changeable behavior. And finally, somebody did, by the way. And she was perfectly socially appropriate about it. Very yeah. apologetic. Very I'm oh sure my gosh, mortified. Sorry. Yeah. Mortified. Yeah. But if all of us are not changing this this little thing, what else are we collectively sort of rolling our eyes at rather than confronting? Mm -hmm. And what did you come up with that we're collectively rolling our eyes about but not really confronting? So there's a list and I, I sort of go through these things in the book, but um, things like uh, our training is far too long and too expensive, and it's only getting longer and more expensive. You know, if you want to get sort of the minimum degree necessary these days to become a licensed therapist, that is a 60 semester unit degree. Mm. In the 1980s, it was a 36 semester unit graduate degree. Mm. And there is not one shred of evidence anywhere that by nearly doubling the length of the degree, We've made therapists any better, any wow. safer, any more effective, um, any in any way measurably improved for having all of that additional education. 
I'm sure that students that are listening to this and even those that are still repaying their student loans uh, are perking up. What are we yeah. talking about in terms of debt for the average student entering the field for what they're getting for in their education? It's uh, the amount of student loan debt is is massive. We don't have great data on the master's level professions, unfortunately. Um, the best data that we have really comes from the field of psychology. And APA has done some gathering uh, of data on licensed psychologists and people coming out of their graduate programs. And if memory serves, the the average student coming out of a PsyD program now, an accredited PsyD program, comes out of that program with six figures of debt, $100,000 at least. Wow. Uh, people coming out of PhD programs are a little bit lower. I think that number was between like 70 and 80. Hmm. Um, but that is a ton of debt. It must, and be our, ben, it must be Ben because they're making just huge amounts of money once they finish. Oh, right. Yeah, no, not so much. Not so much. <laughs> I mean, if only that were true, right? That would be great. But salaries have not really been improving as our training has gotten longer and more expensive. Our salaries are sort of just barely keeping pace with inflation at the master's level. At the doctoral level, if you measure the average psychologist's salary against inflation, psychologist salaries are coming down. And in fact, the psychologists who are engaging in clinical work, the ones who are actually doing therapy with clients, there was some APA data not too long ago showing that those particular psychologists had seen their salaries come down by about 30 oh percent over a few years relative to inflation. Wow. And so one of the impacts of that is that we have a lot of people who finish their degrees and then don't ever actually get licensed because it's too expensive mm. and they're in too much debt. Wow. They have to get a real job. Exactly. They have to get a real job. What, 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 why is this? It's not just a job, right? It's not, uh, you don't, you don't become a therapist for the 401k plan. You're right. Um, you become a therapist because you feel very drawn to helping vulnerable populations. Right. You know, uh, taking people at their worst and, and sort of seeing them through that. And, you know, with, with that in mind, people are so reluctant to complain or to do anything about it mm. because they think, well, that just, that's just how the field is. Am I, am I understanding you correct then uh, by summing up uh, when I say that our sense of a calling may get in the way of us asking and attending to practical matters? Absolutely. So somebody says to you, well, I don't know what you're talking about economically, Ben, because I have a full caseload. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that happens. I'll have people who will, you know, I'll, I'll tell them about some of the things in the book and they'll say, well, honestly, my practice is doing fine. So, you know, why should I be concerned? Mm -hmm. And I will tell them, first of all, good job. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm glad that you're of doing course. well. Mm -hmm. there are, I bet there are a lot of people that you went to graduate school with who mm -hmm. left the field before now. And usually people kind of think about it for a second. They say, oh, yeah. But if you've been doing well, your practice is, is cruising along, you're being helpful to your clients, hopefully you're gathering good outcome data, it's supporting the work that you're doing. There is the possibility, not the guarantee, but the possibility that your status is temporary. Because what we have seen over the past uh, 10, 15 years now is this dramatic drop in how much money is being spent on psychotherapy yeah. in the US. Um, even before the financial crisis that led states to cut billions from their public mental health budgets, uh, inflation adjusted dollars here, the proportion of money or the amount of money spent on mental health care in the US, all sources, public and private, had dropped by about a third. We're talking billions and billions of dollars. All right. And then as the financial crisis sort of abated and, and things started to get better in the economy again, states have started putting money back into their systems, but they're not putting money back into psychotherapy. Mm. They're putting money into crisis care. They're putting money into uh, psychiatric care. Mm. They're putting money into law enforcement. Mm. They're not putting money into outpatient psychotherapy. You're right. Now, I would be remiss, Ben if I led listeners to believe that your book is just uh, you running around saying the sky is falling because actually what you do very well is you've got two by fours, nails and hammers underneath each arm and you're saying there, there's, there's a way out of this. There's a plan. We can shore up the ceiling. We can even make a better building. Can you just give us a few tips about your suggestions in, in, in the book for what, this, what we can do as practitioners? 
Yeah, so a lot of people don't come to a therapist despite having access. Um, you know, and there's there's pretty good evidence. I think you talked about this actually in one of your evolution talks at the at the most recent conference that improving access to care isn't a guarantee that people are going to come. Right. Um, we've we've improved access. More people aren't really coming. Right. And and one of the reasons for that is that there's a big proportion of the population that doesn't trust us that doesn't feel like they could find a therapist that they would really like and trust enough to continue to work with. Mm. And I make the argument in the book that this is actually a, a solvable problem, that you have people who distrust our field, but that can learn to trust you specifically. Part of the reason why people don't trust us is that they are often quite unclear about the values that we hold, that we bring to our work. You know, if I am going to a therapist and I am wrestling with this question, this very difficult and personal question of whether to uh, leave my spouse, I don't know if I go seek out a therapist, I don't know that that therapist is the kind of therapist who's going to uh, adhere to what Bill Doherty talked about as individual expressivism and say essentially, go find your spirit animal, wherever that takes you, whatever makes you happy, I'll support you in getting there. Mm. Or whether I'm gonna find a therapist who is uh, gonna spend more time on, what do you perceive as your obligations? What are you supposed to be doing here? What does your moral code suggest? Mm. Wow. Those are very different kinds of therapy. Mm. And if I am Joe or Jane client, most of the therapists in the world, including private practice therapists, don't give you any way in their marketing to really know what kind of therapist you are, what kind of person you are. Yeah. A lot of what makes therapy work is the relationship that we build with our clients. And yet, I, I talk with a lot of people still who are, are trained or were trained that if a client asks you a question about what you believe about something mm. to say, well, why is that interesting to you? Mm -hmm. Tell me why you've asked that question, <laughs> as opposed to just answering it and being a person and letting your client know you and trust you. So one of the things that we can do, um, anybody in, at any career stage, any level of practice, is to get clarity around your own purpose and values. Why are you doing this work? Mm -hmm. What kind of therapist are you? And how does that make you different from the therapist down the street? And if you can communicate that to your clients, you will start to solve this problem of public trust in our work. Wow. That's beautifully stated, Ben. And in each chapter in the book, not only a statement of what's going on that threatens the very foundations and existence of, of psychotherapy, but also step-by-step -step solutions. It's one of the things I admired most. You really were about saving psychotherapy. Ben, thanks so very much for talking with me today. If people want to get a hold of you, uh, chat with you. Uh, how can they? How can they reach you? Well, for better or for worse, I'm not terribly hard to find. Um, I've got a, a company called Ben Caldwell Labs. We're at bencaldwelllabs.com. Okay. Um, and uh, anybody who wants to to find me on, yeah, I'm easily findable on Facebook and those kind of places as well. Um, you know, if people want to shoot me an email and ask questions about the book, or if people have interesting sort of data to add, because we'll probably do a second edition here in a couple of years. Fantastic. Uh, ben at bencaldwell.com. Perfect, Ben. Thanks very much for the time. Thank you, Scott. Really appreciate it.